Kavita. We are very happy to have Kavita Vidara here to give the presentation, which is the mind-body connections, important implications for health services and systems. How can we use this knowledge and bring it into clinical practice? We are dying to know that now. Please. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and um, I'd like to start by thanking the uh, organizing committee for inviting me to, to present at this meeting. It's a great honor and privilege to be here. Uh, thank you for that kind introduction. Um, I hope I'll be able to at least come close to answering some of those issues that you've raised. What I'd like to do then today is talk to you about this field, psychoneuroimmunology, but I'm going to refer to it as PNI because it's a little bit of a mouthful. And what we'd like to talk about specifically today is the implications of this area of research for our understanding of not only health, but the potential it may have for our understanding of how we might deliver health services in the future. Now, I'm aware that for many of you in this audience, the field of PNI may be quite unfamiliar, so I thought I might start with a bit of definition to help to put the research into some sort of context. So PNI is usually defined as an area of science concerned with the bi-directional relationships between psychological and biological processes. And importantly for today's conference, um, it's also concerned with the implications of these relationships for health. Put another way, this is the science of the connections between the mind and the body. So that's what PNI is. What it's not is it's not a new idea. I'm sure that many of you can appreciate that the idea or the notion that the mind and body may be connected has been around for millennia. One of the earliest references to it that I'm aware of comes from the ancient Greek philosopher Democritus, who in 400 BC said, if the body were to sue the mind for cruel and unusual punishment, the mind would have to pay. Several generations later, the very distinguished physician Osler in 1892 remarked that it's much more important to know what sort of patient has a disease rather than what sort of a disease a patient has. Okay, so those are just two examples of the huge number of people who over the generations have speculated on firstly the existence of a connection between the mind and the body, but also whether or not these relationships have any implications for health but it's widely considered that rigorous scientific inquiry into these relationships didn't really start until the mid-70s, and it's considered by many that this commenced with the pioneering work of Adrian Cohen, who in 1975 coined this term psychoneuroimmunology. And in so doing, they provided us with a scientific framework in which we could start investigating these relationships. So what's PNI been doing for the last 40 years? Well, the field's been concerned with two main things. Firstly, it's been concerned with delineating these pathways between the mind and the body. And I can say without fear of contradiction that we now have very well recognized biobehavioral and purely biological pathways that connect the mind to the body and the body to the mind. The second area of interest is to try and understand what these connections, what these relationships, what the implications might be for our health. Or put another way, do they have any clinical relevance? Well, it's this issue of clinical relevance that I'm going to talk about this evening. And what I'd like to do is to focus attention, because I've only got a short period of time, on two clinical outcomes which we know are of great concern to most healthcare systems, vulnerability to disease and progression of disease. I'm going to focus on two conditions which are common, costly, and it's no coincidence they occur predominantly in older people. Influenza in terms of disease vulnerability and diabetes and specifically diabetic foot ulceration in terms of progression. And the evidence I'm going to talk about, I will talk about in the context of what we know healthcare systems or healthcare services do currently to manage these conditions. So in terms of reducing vulnerability to flu, as you've already heard, vaccines, preventative vaccines, tend to be the primary approach in most healthcare systems. And in terms of diabetic foot ulcers, most treatments involve intensive podiatry-led treatment. Okay, so looking at the first of these areas, let's look first at the clinical context. And what do we know about flu? Well, we know that it's associated with considerable morbidity and mortality. It's been estimated to result in up to 5 million cases of severe illness each year. 
potentially resulting in half a million deaths. And we also know it's a disease which disproportionately affects the elderly, with 90% of flu-related mortality occurring in older people. What do healthcare systems do with regards to the risk of this disease? Well, as I've already mentioned, the primary approach to prevention is vaccinations. Most developed nations have preventative vaccine programs. And certainly, according to the Centers for Disease Control, vaccinations are among the 10 most important healthcare achievements that we have ever made. However, what is the evidence for the clinical effectiveness of vaccinations? Are they as effective as they might be? Well, if you look closely at this evidence, some of it is in fact of poor quality and some of it's quite mixed. So efficacy estimates are how well does this vaccine prevent disease? Some of those estimates are as low as 39%. How does psychoneuroimmunology fit into this context? What can we learn from PNI in terms of improving our understanding of vulnerability to flu? Well, I think there are at least three reasons why PNI approaches are wholly relevant to this clinical context. Firstly, we know that the effectiveness of all vaccines is dependent upon the immune system's ability to respond to the antigens contained in the vaccination. So what that means is that if there are factors at play which can compromise the integrity of the immune system, they will in turn compromise the ability of those vaccines to work effectively. There are two such factors which are highly relevant here. Firstly, we know that the elderly experience a natural waning of their immune system simply as a function of getting older, a phenomenon known as immune senescence. We also know, after 40 years of research in PNI, that the experience of psychological distress, in particular chronic protracted distress, can also result in significant immune impairment. This led us to speculate that it was possible that one group of individuals for whom flu vaccines may not work terribly well are older individuals who are chronically distressed. And if we believe the epidemiological data, while well, mild to moderate psychological distress occurs in up to 50% of people, uh, older people in the community. So we're potentially talking about a large number of people for whom vaccines may not work as well as they might. So we designed a study to explore precisely this question. Do flu vaccines work less well in older people who experience chronic distress compared with their less distressed counterparts? In order to examine this, we focused on a population who we knew from related work would be highly likely to be experiencing chronic psychological distress, namely spousal carers of patients living with dementia. This slide just shows you an overview of the main characteristics of those individuals in our study. We also recruited a control group who were matched as closely as possible for age, gender, and household income. But the key uh, distinguishing characteristic was that these were individuals who were not caring for a spouse with dementia or indeed any other chronic disease. So they had no significant caregiving responsibilities. In order to answer our question, we conducted an observational study and this involved following up our participants at three monthly intervals over a 12 month period. We undertook a broad range of assessments during this time and I won't go into a huge amount of detail on this right now, but suffice to say we measured levels of psychological distress. We looked at potential biological mechanisms that could be explaining any potential relationship between distress and immune responses to vaccination. And of course, we looked at immune function so that we could determine how well individuals were responding to flu vaccine. At the start of our study, we conducted a very general, non-specific assessment of the immune system, but we designed our study so that the six-month follow-up coincided with the start of the flu season. That enabled us to give all of our participants influenza vaccinations and then measure the nature of their antibody response to this vaccine, which we did by taking blood samples prior to vaccine and again 7, 14 and 28 days later. So our primary question in this study then was, was there any evidence that being a chronically distressed older individual would result in influenza vaccination being less effective? And the way that we assessed that was to look at the number of people in each group who were able to produce a clinically appropriate response to the vaccine. In the case of flu, this is denoted by a fourfold increase in antibody. That denotes protection. This is what we observed. Only 16% of our chronically stressed carers produced a clinically appropriate response to the vaccine, compared with 39% of our control group, suggesting to us that even after vaccination, fewer than one in five of our carers were actually protected against flu. So, 
These data suggest to us then that psychological distress is potentially hugely important in determining the efficacy of vaccinations. The question is, what can we do next? Can this inform healthcare practice moving forward? Well, we decided that in this particular study, what we had implicated was psychological distress as being potentially important in undermining the effectiveness of flu vaccine. It seemed like an obvious study to then explore whether or not if we could reduce psychological distress, could we enhance the immune response to vaccine? So we conducted a preliminary study which looked at precisely this question. And once again, we focused on spousal carers of dementia patients as a way of looking at a chronically stre stressed older population. The study was very similar in design, so we've got a group of spousal carers and age and gender matched non-caregiving controls. And these individuals participated in a study that had two main phases. For the first phase, those, uh, our caregiver group were allocated into one of two conditions. One group received a cognitive behavioral stress management intervention. This was delivered by a psychologist once a week over an eight week period, a fairly standardized stress management intervention. And it was conducted in a, in a group based context. For the other two groups, the carers who didn't receive the intervention and the control group, it was usual care. We, we didn't do anything with either of those groups and we undertook a range of assessments in all three groups over the course of that intervention period. About two to three weeks later, we had the vaccination phase and here to maximize comparability with our first study we again used flu vaccine so participants attended the study site we first took a blood sample we vaccinated them against flu and took blood samples again two four and six weeks later so our question here was is there any evidence that participation in a stress management intervention could enhance the immune response to vaccination and the way that we looked at this was exactly the same as the way we had done in our first study. So we looked at the number of people who were able to produce a clinically appropriate response to the vaccine, a fourfold increase in antibody to denote clinical protection against flu. And this is what we observed. For this study, 50% of those carers who received our intervention produced a clinically appropriate response to the vaccine compared with only 7% on this occasion of those carers who did not receive the intervention and indeed 29% of the control group. So what can we conclude here in terms of the relevance of PNI for our understanding of health and potentially for the delivery of healthcare? Well, I think what we've got here, and I've just given you two examples of what is now a huge literature, which has shown time and time again that the experience of chronic psychological distress results in a significant dysregulation in immune function. And this dysregulation, we would argue, certainly in older people, may well be clinically relevant in that we're seeing evidence, and many other groups have replicated this, that vaccines appear to be less effective. That being the case, it increases the vulnerability to disease in this already vulnerable group. And thirdly, and this is where this is the potential hope for the future in terms of how we might think again about uh, novel approaches to healthcare, what we're seeing is that a stress management intervention, a psychological treatment, was able to significantly enhance the antibody response to vaccination. And if that's the case, and this is only preliminary evidence, it may therefore provide a non-pharmacological approach for optimizing vaccine efficacy. Okay. I'd like to now move to a completely different uh, disease area, to move away from flu and to diabetic foot ulcers. And again, let me start with the clinical context. I'm sure there's nobody in this audience who needs to be reminded about the sheer scale of the problem of diabetes. We know that it's a disease that affects more than 300 million people globally, and its prevalence has increased by over 170% in the last 30 years. And there's every reason to believe that that trend is going to continue unless we can do something quite dramatic. Now, 25% of all people with diabetes are known to be affected by diabetic foot ulceration at some point during their lifetime. And we know that it's a complication of diabetes associated with considerable morbidity, increased risk of mortality, and it's the leading cause of amputation. What's the healthcare context? How do we manage uh, diabetic foot ulcers currently? Well, for most uh, developed um, health, uh, healthcare systems in developed countries, the approach tends to involve intensive podiatry-led treatment. So this involves debridement of the ulcer area, repeated changing of dressings, and patient education. 
But there are several reasons to believe, much like my argument with vaccinations, that our approach to dealing with this clinical problem is not yet optimal. The reasons for that are that if you look at the evidence, it's clear that 70% of these ulcers continue to be unhealed even after five months of specialist care in secondary care settings. Even when these ulcers are resolved, we know that 34% of patients will re-ulcerate within 12 months. And in terms of patient education, successive systematic reviews show that patient education is of absolutely no clinical benefit. So what can we do differently to try and improve the healthcare for this particular condition? And how does psychoneuroimmunology fit in? Well, again, I'd like to suggest to you that I think there are several reasons why PNI is wholly relevant here. Firstly, as I suggested in the context of vaccinations, we know that the immune system plays a pivotal role in the healing or the resolution of all sorts of wounds, including diabetic foot ulcers. So once again, what that means is that factors which can influence the effectiveness of the immune system will potentially impact on the body's ability to resolve wounds. As I've already mentioned to you, we know that psychological factors and emotional distress in particular is also able to dysregulate the immune system. And this has led to a huge amount of interest in whether or not psychological distress and related psychological factors might influence the rates at which wounds heal. And thus far, there's been a lot of interest in this area, but most of it's been experimental. And what I'd like to briefly do is just share with you details of the very first experimental study that was published in this area so that you can put the work that we've done into some sort of context. So this is work published back in 95 by um, one of the leaders in our field, Janice Kikok Glazer and her colleagues, and they conducted a very simple but elegant study. They wanted to know whether the experience of chronic psychological distress in older individuals would be associated with delays in the healing of wounds. They did this by focusing, much as we had done, on a group of spousal carers of dementia patients, a, a population we know to be uh, at high risk of psychological distress, and age and gender match controls. They gave all of these individuals a very small experimental wound, a three and a half millimeter punch biopsy wound. It's the sort of thing that you can inflict on someone with a device, as you can see here on the left. Uh, producing a tiny wound, three and a half millimeters in size, as you can see on the right. And what they did was followed up these individuals until complete healing of these small experimental wounds had been achieved. This is what they observed. They found that their chronically stressed group of carers took on average nine days longer to heal these very small experimental wounds. Now this is just one study and it's one example, but I can tell you there's been an explosion of interest in the relationship between psychological factors and the resolution of wounds. Thus far, much of this work has focused on small experimental wounds of the sort that I've described. In my group, we were interested in the clinical relevance of these observations. We wanted to know whether this relationship between psychological factors and the healing of wounds would be upheld in a clinical context, which is much more complicated, but also where delays in healing might have very real implications for patient morbidity and mortality, but also in terms of healthcare costs. So we designed a study to examine whether or not psychological factors could influence the healing of diabetic foot ulcers. Much as we'd started with our vaccine work, our first approach here was to conduct an observational study. We conducted a study in which we recruited patients with diabetic foot ulcers. They were all recruited from specialist podiatry clinics in secondary care. So these are patients who've got an active ulcer at the time that they enter the study, and they agreed to be followed up on four occasions over a 24-week period. Again, we undertook a range of assessments, which I won't go into too much detail about, but obviously we looked at the size of their ulcers or their wounds every time we saw them. We looked at biomedical factors, such as levels of glucose control, neuropathy, ischemia, all the usual factors you'd expect to influence ulcer healing. And we considered a range of psychosocial and behavioral determinants of healing also. The next slide is uh, going to give you a summary of the participants in our study. It also contains an image of a diabetic foot ulcer. So for those of you who are slightly squeamish, I suggest you just look away briefly. Um, the reason I put this slide up is not just to uh, 
try and scare you with a picture of the ulcer, but actually to point out that in this work we're dealing with wounds that are much larger and much more complicated than the kinds of wounds that have been looked at in the experimental research that has really informed the work that we've done. You can see that the average area of the ulcers that we're dealing with is 17 centimetres squared. Nearly half of our patients had infections in those wounds at the time they entered our study. And you can see from mean levels of glucose control that this is indeed a population whose underlying diabetes is fairly poorly controlled. By the end point of our study, just over half of our patients had a healed ulcer. So our primary analysis was concerned with trying to identify which factors predicted whether or not an ulcer would heal over a 24-week period. And our approach to this was to take two steps. In the first step, we wanted to isolate all the clinical and demographic determinants of healing. So we took a parsimonious approach to this by firstly examining each potential predictor in a univariate analysis, so we considered each variable one, one at a time, and they only had to reach uh, the significance criterion of p equals 0.1 to be considered in our final multivariate model. This next slide gives you a summary of those clinical factors which emerged as potential predictors of whether or not these wounds would resolve over a 24-week period type of diabetes, levels of ischemia at baseline, having a concurrent diagnosis of angina or heart disease, and not too surprisingly, the size of their ulcers when they entered the study. The second step was the most critical from our perspective. We wanted to know whether psychological factors contributed any unique variance to whether or not these wounds would heal over a six month period. So in other words, can they predict ulcer healing after you take into account all those other clinical and demographic determinants? So again, we started with univariate analysis in order to isolate which psychological or behavioral factors may be relevant. And uh, we then entered the relevant variables into the analysis. The univariate analysis threw up two psychological factors of interest. Not too surprisingly, levels of depression looked like they were potentially important, and also patients' coping style. The next slide I'm going to show you shows you the results from the final multivariate model, and it identifies those variables which emerged as significant independent predictors. So once you put all of the variables into the model, there are in fact only two independent predictors of whether or not these wounds will heal over six months. The size of the ulcer at baseline, so the larger the ulcer when they entered the study, the less likely it was to have healed. That's perhaps not too surprising. But also a patient's coping style. That emerged as a significant independent predictor. Patients with a greater propensity towards a confrontational style were much less likely to have a healed ulcer 24 weeks later. So again, where do we go next with this kind of evidence? What we have here in this study is the first evidence that I'm aware of, which implicates a patient's coping style as being important in determining a clinical outcome, the healing of diabetic foot ulcers. And what's important about these data is that the effect of coping persists after you take into account all the other known clinical and demographic determinants of healing in this group. The question is, can any of this evidence inform healthcare practice and, and what exactly could we do next? Well, there were several streams of evidence that have influenced what we've chosen to do uh, next in this particular area. Firstly, as I've already alluded to, we know that outside of standard podiatry care, most interventions have tended to be educational. But we know that educational interventions in this patient group are not effective. They have no clinical benefit. There are at least two systematic reviews, if not more, which demonstrate this time and time again. Now, this contrasts with what is now a growing body of work, which implicates a range of psychosocial factors as being relevant to a range of ulcer outcomes. We have evidence for cognitive, emotional, social, and behavioral factors influencing factors such as ulcer recurrence, ulcer healing, ulcer incidence, amputation, to name just a few. We also know that the biggest risk factor for this population, in terms of developing an ulcer, is having had one previously. And if you combine that with economic data, which suggests to us that the, beta, the, the greatest health and economic benefit will be accrued from interventions which don't necessarily just focus on promoting healing, but also focus on reducing reulceration risk, well, then that suggested to us that what we needed to develop was a psychological intervention which focused not only on ulcer resolution, ulcer healing, but also reducing the risk of recurrence. And that's precisely what we've developed in the last year or so. The intervention itself is known as the REDUCE intervention. 
And as I've mentioned, it has two main aims. We wish to help delay or prevent the onset of further ulcers, secondary prevention if you like, and to also improve ulcer healing in the event of reulceration. And that's in recognition of the fact that we know that the risk of reulceration is really high in this patient group. The intervention itself is uh, a CBT-based intervention. Um, I don't know how much of that, oh, you can actually read a fair amount of that, but this is just to let you know what, what the ingredients of our intervention um, are. So what we've identified from the existing literature is that there are several psychosocial risks which we feel there is evidence for, which appear to be related not only to the rates at which ulcers heal, but to also the risk of recurrence. These are risks such as behavioral factors, such as patient inactivity, emotional factors such as depression, cognitive factors such as coping style, as I described in our work, and social factors such as social isolation. This uh, conceptual model, having identified the risk factors, means that we can then specify the goals of our intervention, which you can see here, and also the intervention tools. As I've mentioned, we've only recently developed this intervention, so at this point in time, we've only been able to conduct a very early evaluation of it, which we've done by recruiting a, a small number of people with diabetes who've had an ulcer previously, and these individuals have been randomized two to one to receive our intervention or not. We've designed the intervention specifically so that it can be delivered by existing healthcare staff, so we know it's possible to train podiatrists and diabetic nurses to deliver it. And given that it's such a small feasibility study at this stage, our concern with our preliminary evaluation has been primarily on establishing the acceptability of the intervention to patients, the feasibility of it being delivered, and also all we've done is really a qualitative evaluation at this point to see whether the psychosocial risk factors that we've targeted in the intervention do in fact appear to be amenable to change. This next slide just gives you a flavor of what we found from that qualitative evaluation. So these are just um, mean scores from standardized questionnaires which we got our participants to complete three months after the intervention ended. So we're looking at enduring effects here. And what you can see is that those patients who received our intervention do indeed report more social support. They perceive greater personal control. They feel they've got a greater understanding of their condition. They're reporting lower levels of depression and an increase in their self-care behaviors. So what can we conclude here in terms of the potential importance of PNI, not only for our understanding of diabetic foot ulcers, but the future provision of care? Well, what we've got from the two studies I've described is firstly evidence suggesting that coping patients' coping style may well be really important. We see it being an independent predictor of whether or not these ulcers will heal over a six-month period. And it's early days for our intervention, but what we've got, we feel, is preliminary evidence suggesting that a psychosocial approach to improving ulcer outcomes is acceptable to patients and appears to be producing appropriate and sustainable changes in the psychosocial risk factors that we have evidence for that are related to ulcer recurrence and delayed healing. Obviously, what we need next is an RCT to establish whether or not the intervention does indeed have the clinical benefits that we're expecting and whether in the process of trying to secure that funding as we speak. So in summary then, this has just been an incredibly quick overview, a quick introduction to psychoneuroimmunology. Um, I focused on two what I hope you feel are important uh, clinical areas, disease vulnerability and disease progression, but I've only used influenza and diabetic foot ulcers as examples. The work in this area has much wider application than those two conditions, and I hope that you can see that some of the principles that I've been talking about are of relevance to a range of clinical contexts and a range of different clinical areas. And I hope the future is that we can in fact use PNI principles to not only improve our understanding of diseases and health, but also to change the way that we deliver healthcare so that we treat not only the underlying disease, but also the patient. Thank you very much for your attention.